How's everybody doing? Everybody here is wanting extra credit today, aren't they? We will probably have some. Uh, I do have the exams with me, and the exams are graded, and I can tell you a little bit about it. The average on the exam was uh, 64, which was just about a point off of last time. Um, I was pretty pleased, I have to say. Uh, this, I felt, was, since there, there was a lot, I heard from a lot of you, there was a lot more material on this exam than the last exam. Uh, that pulling out a 64, I thought, was, uh, was pretty good. So I was, I was fairly pleased with that. Um, the range of scores, of course, there's always people who can improve, and I want to see the, that improvement. The range of scores went from 9 up to 2 people got 101. Uh, so uh, very wide range of scores. Uh, I haven't yet posted a grade distribution. I will post that uh, this weekend. Uh, so you can see where your scores, and what I'll do is I'll do it for the sum of the first two exams. So you'll see if you add up your two scores where you stand grade-wise in the course. So as always, if you have concerns or questions or whatever, let me know. I'm always happy to meet with you. And, um, but overall, I thought it was a, uh, that performance was pretty good. So I was um, pleased. I would say about two-thirds of the people knew how to spell complimentary. I was disappointed that there were anybody who didn't know that after I told them it was going to be on the exam. But, um, and there were a few people who didn't even try, which was a little odd, too. But in any event, um, let's see. So uh, what I want to do today is I want to go through, talk more about biotechnology. Um, I promise I will try to get done fast so we can get out of here reasonably early. So if I'm going faster than normal, that's probably why. And if you need me to slow down, and some people, in fact, somebody last time said, please slow down. So I will slow down uh, as well. Uh, I'll just get through the topics fairly quickly. So I'll try to do that without talking fast. Does that make sense? No. Doesn't make any sense at all. OK. Um, so last time I started talking about uh, an expression vector. All right? An expression vector was a plasmid. And an expression vector is a plasmid that has certain characteristics. Okay? It has certain characteristics. So I mentioned a couple of them, and I said I would mention the third one uh, today. So let's uh, think about a plasmid. Here is um, an expression vector plasmid. Okay? Well, why do we use plasmids? And I, I mentioned last time that plasmids are circular DNAs that replicate in bacterial cells. And they're much smaller than the bacterial DNA itself. So they're much more easy to manipulate. You don't break them as easily, et cetera. Okay? These plasmids, because they replicate in cells, can be put into cells. And when the cell divides, the plasmid divides, and everybody's happy. So that's a good thing. Okay? And there's really three qualities that we think about with respect to plasmids. Excuse me. One quality is that it, it must have a replication origin. And that means it's got to be able to replicate in the cell. Well, since I've already told you that that happens, you know that that, that is, a, is a necessary quality. A second quality is that the plasmid should have a promoter if we're going to use it to make protein. Because a promoter is necessary for the RNA polymerase to bind and start transcribing the gene that we want to transcribe. So we can use these plasmids to make proteins in bacterial cells. That turns out to be really useful. If I have a human protein that I talked about last time, like let's say human growth hormone or a blood clotting factor, and I want to make a lot of it, I can put that coding region into a bacterial cell. I'm sorry, into a plasmid in, in a bacterial cell. And then that uh, plasmid will make that protein. So it's really, really useful for me. The third factor that I need is a way of identifying which bacteria get the plasmid. Because remember, I'm going to take the plasmid out of bacteria. I'm going to put my DNA into it. And then I'm going to put that plasmid back into bacteria. So I really have to have a way of identifying which bacteria get the plasmid. And that might seem like, well, that's kind of a dumb thing to think about. But it won't when I tell you the efficiency with which we put plasmids into bacteria. Okay? 
putting a plasmid into a bacterium is not a trivial thing. The process, the, the technique is very simple, but the efficiency is very, very low. At the highest efficiency of getting a plasmid into a bacteria, we're, into a bacterium, we are talking about on the order of about one per thousand to one in 10,000. So that means for every 9,999 bacteria, or 10,000 bacteria, 9,999 will not have a plasmid, and one will. So being able to identify the one that will is useful and important. Well, the most common way that we do that is by including on the plasmid something that's called an identifiable marker. A marker is just like its name would suggest, something that flags or identifies itself. So an identifiable marker, one of the most common ones that's used, is resistance to an antibiotic. Because it's very, very easy with this. So let's say I've got this plasmid, and let's say this little green section over here is a gene that gives resistance to an antibiotic like ampicillin. It's a form of penicillin. Okay? It gives resistance to ampicillin. If I take this plasmid and I open it up and I put my DNA of interest into it, and I want to go put it back into bacteria, first of all, I'm going to put it into bacteria that don't have a plasmid, right? Wouldn't want to put it back into a bacterium that already had a plasmid. I'm putting it into a bacterium that doesn't have a plasmid. And one in 10,000 of those bacteria is going to get that plasmid that I put into it. I can identify those bacteria that get the plasmid very simply by growing the bacteria in the presence of ampicillin. Because only those that get the plasmid will grow, and those that don't get the plasmid will die. So I've used the process of selection to get the bacteria that I'm after. Okay? So this marker really helps me to now get the thing that I'm after. There are a variety of uh, expression vectors that are out there. All right? PET is a very popular one. There's a couple others. PBR322 is an ancient one, and it's not even really an expression vector, so I'm not going to show you that one. Another one that's commonly used is called PUC19. And for what it's worth, there's PUC19. You can see the size of PUC19. It's uh, very nice because it's fairly small. It's about 2,700 base pairs in size, so it's not overly large. And it's got a, uh, some very useful places in it where I can insert a DNA uh, in front of a promoter. So these are all located in about this region right here. And I'll say more about that in just a little bit. OK. Um, this sort of shows the process that I've just described to you. So here's a uh, bacterial plasmid, OK? It has a replication origin that's not shown on there, and it also has a gene for an antibiotic resistance. I can take that plasmid out of bacteria. I can open it up with, it, with a restriction endonuclease, and I can ligate into it a foreign gene that uh, is cut with the same enzyme. And you can see I've made, in this case, the second uh, figure over, I've made a recombinant DNA. And that recombinant DNA I can put back into a bacterial cell. Okay? And I can select for those that get the plasmid by growing them in the presence of an antibiotic. And that seems pretty simple, and it is actually a fairly simple process. But there are some considerations that we have when we do this. So one of the considerations I've already given you is the fact that getting the plasmid into the bacterium is a fairly inefficient process. Okay? The next thing that we want to think about is actually the business of putting the gene into the plasmid. This step right here, where it says insert foreign gene. Okay? That step turns out to be fairly inefficient as well. Okay? Why is it inefficient? Well, let's imagine I've taken this plasmid that I have, and I cut this plasmid with a restriction enzyme so that I break it right there where my pointer is. 
So now I've got what we would describe as linear DNA. It can be linear, it can look like a circle, but it's broken. Okay? And if I take that thing and I mix it with the foreign gene, not everything that I get when I add DNA ligase will come back like this. In fact, this is one of the least likely things that will actually happen. Does anybody know why? Okay. It's kind of a, I won't say it's a trick question, but it's a tricky question. The reason, what, what the most common thing is that you will get if you do the experiment that I just described to you, and you mix this insert with the linearized DNA, is that the most common thing you'll get is actually this guy on the left. No insert. It'll just, the plasma will come back on itself because it's much more likely that this end is going to find this end than these two ends are going to find something else that's floating out there. Okay? So this end of the plasma finds this end of the plasma very efficiently, but these ends don't find other things floating in solution nearly so easily. Well, we have to take that into consideration when we want to identify not only the cells that get a plasmid, but also the cells that get a plasmid that have an insert, right? Because if all I do is screen for antibiotic resistance, both these guys on the left and these guys with the insert are both going to show up, right? So I'd like to have a way to tell me which cells have the insert, right? In addition to which cells get the plasma. And that's actually done with something called blue-white screening. So this, this outlines it right here, and I'm going to step you through it. Blue-white screening is a very powerful technique. And it relies on a gene you've already learned something about. And that gene is the LAC-Z gene. Remember the lactose operon had a couple of genes that I said were very important for lactose metabolism. For our purposes, the most important of those genes is called LAC-Z. Now what LAC-Z normally does for a cell is LAC-Z gene that a cell has floating around inside of it, the LAC-Z gene will take lactose and break it down into glucose and galactose. And those two sugars are very useful for the cell because they provide energy for the cell. Okay? Biochemists being evil people and lazy people use that gene. They're not evil. Well, there are some that are evil, but this isn't evil, okay? All right. So biochemists are, maybe I should just describe us as lazy people. Okay, so we're lazy people. We want to have easy ways of identifying things. So we have found that the LAC-Z gene, that is the enzyme that's made by that, and by the way, the, the, the gene product is called beta-galactosidase. Beta-galactosidase, and I'll put that in the, in the highlights, so I won't spell it here. That's the enzyme that is produced by the coding for that gene. Beta-galactosidase is the enzyme that breaks down uh, lactose into galactose and glucose. All right. We found that if we can take a chemical that's man-made called X-gal, X, the letter X dash G-A-L, okay? And if we give that chemical to bacteria, the bacteria will look at that chemical just like it's lactose and they'll cut it. You remember the, the yellow color I told you about with respect to the chymotrypsin? And I said biochemists were lazy there, so they found something chymotrypsin would cut. And when they cut it, it produced a yellow color. Anybody remember that experiment? Well, it's Friday, yeah. Serine proteases, right? Right? OK. In this case, X-gal is something that has a blue color to start with. It has a blue color. And if beta-galactosidase cuts X-gal, the blue color is lost. It becomes white. 
Okay? Beta galactosidase will cut X gal and convert it from a blue color into a white color. Everybody with me so far? We're not quite done. But you have to understand that component of the beta galactosidase. All right, so there's the beta galactosidase gene. There's my ampicillin resistance, and down here somewhere is the replication origin. And I want to get this fragment of my own put into bacteria, in this plasmid for the bacteria to make my protein. What do I do? Well, what I do is I cut in the beta galactosidase gene, and I cut my foreign DNA with the same restriction enzyme. And I take and I ligate everything together. Now, based on what I've told you, you should predict that you're going to get two, actually three possible outcomes. Two with respect to the ligation. One, OK, is that you're going to get ligation and you're going to get no insert. That's this guy right here. You cut it, but it came right back on itself, and you got no foreign gene inserted. Well, what you did was you broke open the beta galactosidase gene, but you put it right back together. So the beta galactosidase gene in those cells is going to be, and I just screwed that up, didn't I? Why do I have that backwards in my head? Am I backwards in my head, Josh? Uh, you're well, okay, then I've got it backwards. Good thing I've got Josh here. <laughs> Maybe we'll go back and scratch what I just said. All right. Beta galactosidase, when it cuts X gal, I guess that's right. You're right. You are right. Yeah. When it cuts X gal, boy, it's Friday, you can tell, right? And there's too much spring fever out there. All right, beta galactosidase will cut X gal and make it blue instead of destroying the blue. Got it. Okay. So we get a blue color if beta galactosidase cuts X gal. Everybody, another got everybody totally confused. What's that? So it starts white. Starts white, turns blue. Sorry. All right, I'm going to give you extra credit. Just relax. I'll make up for it. Okay. <laughs> All right, so beta galactosidase is functional. We put X gal there, we get a blue color. So if we have no insert, those cells will have a blue color, right? If we get an insert, that insert is going to interrupt the beta galactosidase gene. The beta galactosidase gene will not be produced properly. It will not be functional. And therefore, those cells will not be able to cut X gal and the X gal will remain white. OK? So now we have a way of telling which cells get the insert by the color that they are. Those that get the insert will be white. Those that, get, that don't get the insert will be blue. In both cases, those cells will be resistant to the antibiotic because they've both got the plasmid. The third case, of course, is cells that don't get the plasmid, but when we grow them in the presence of antibiotic, we see nothing because they all die. OK. <coughs> so blue-white screening is a very useful technique to help tell us which things get the insert. All right. Let's see. Let's talk about histidine tagging. And I'm just slithering through this quickly so we can get done, OK? Histidine tagging. I keep telling you biochemists are lazy, and then I keep demonstrating to you that we really are lazy. And so this next one is a really cool technique that really demonstrates our laziness, OK? One of the things that we do when we make a protein 
that we want to take out of his cells, we have to purify that protein. If I made a blood clotting factor in bacteria, and I had bacteria make that protein, I could make a lot of that protein, but I would also have a lot of bacterial protein mixed with it. So if I go and I bust open those cells, that's what I'm going to get. Well, you may remember when we talked about techniques earlier, we talked about affinity chromatography. Does anybody remember affinity chromatography? How does affinity chromatography work? Is what? So you select on the basis of a protein having affinity for something on the column, right? Which is what you're saying, right? OK. You select for a protein having affinity for something on the column. All right? Well, there's something called histidine tagging okay, that is using an affinity chromatography method to purify a protein. Okay? Now, this is a cool trick. Let's say I've got a protein, the Kevin Ahern protein. And the Kevin Ahern protein is something I've pulled out of, I, the gene I've pulled out of my cells. And I want to make a ton of this protein because it's going to make the world a better place. Which a Kevin Ahern protein, of course, would, right? Nobody, no, no, don't look at him. He says that, right? Don't look at him, OK? All right? Well, I want to purify this Kevin Ahern protein because it's mixed with a bunch of bacterial proteins that'll make the world a worse place, right? So I want to get my proteins separate from theirs. Well, if I'm very careful, I can design my protein to have some features so that my protein will bind to something on a column. I'm going to put an artificial grabber on my protein that's going to grab something that's on the column. How do I do that? All right. Well, it turns out that I can take a string of histidine residues. That is histidine, 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 histidine. Okay. And if I take my, that is the code, so how, do I, how, would I, how would I make a protein that had those? I would take the genetic code for those, right? I would put it in front of a promoter. So I have promoter coding for a bunch of histidines. And then after the histidines, I would put the coding for my gene. So that when the bacterium made my gene, it would make histidine, 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 Kevin Ahern's protein going all the way across here. My protein would be attached to a bunch of histidines. What I just created is something we call a histidine tag. Now my protein's been altered. It's got histidines on in addition to the normal amino acids of my protein. But we're going to get rid of it. All right? For right now, we need to have that tag. Everybody with me? Understand what my protein looks like? Histidines followed by the coding for my protein over here. And they're all one polypeptide chain. Okay? Well, those histidines are picked for a reason, because those histidines will, in fact, if I put them onto a column, they will bind to nickel. They'll bind to the atom nickel. Well, if we think about this, we've just created an affinity tagged protein. And the only protein that's affinity tagged is my protein. The bacterial proteins won't have that histidine tag. Only my protein will have that tag. So when I bust open the bacterial cells and pour them on top of this nickel column, what's going to happen? Well, my protein, which is shown here in green, is going to stick but by virtue of the histidine tag. And all the bacterial proteins which don't have the histidine tag will come shooting through the column. I've separated the bacterial proteins from my protein. How do I get my protein off of the column? What do I have to add? Add what? Not histidine tags, no. Nice, nice try. 
What would I add? Add, add more what? No, you're not quite there. I got two points of extra credit for whoever gets it. Add what? Not water. What? Not buffer. It's very easy, guys. You know, you know the answer to this. We've talked about it before. Nickel. You put nickel in there, right? Because the histidine wants to bind to the nickel, and it lets go. And when it lets go and grabs a hold of the nickel that you put onto it, it comes shooting through. So that's what's happened here. I've eluded the protein by adding nickel to it. All right. Well, at this point, I've got my protein that's got nickel attached to histidine on the end of it. You might say, well, that's not exactly your protein. You can't make the world a better place with that protein. But there are enzymes that I can use that will cleave off that histidine tag. So I'm left behind with only my protein. So histidine tagging provides me a very simple and efficient way to purify a protein that I have a bacterial cell make. Do it very easily. And I can make a ton of it, too. OK. Questions about that? Everybody's ready to get out of here. OK. OK. Um, I'm going to talk about one more technique, and then I'm going to shut up. How about that? You guys like that? Or we can stay here for another week. Uh. OK. The last technique I want to talk about is one you probably have heard about, or may, in some cases you probably have used if you've worked in a laboratory. And it's a technique called the polymerase chain reaction. How many people have done PCR? Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. So polymerase chain reaction is a method for specifically making millions and billions of copies of a desired DNA. And the way that it works is it actually steals the idea from a cell. It steals the idea from a cell. The technique was invented by, by um, um, a man named Kerry Mullis, who was driving home from his laboratory in Southern California one night, and has this idea that, well, maybe we could use DNA replication techniques to amplify something. That was his idea. And then, as he was driving home, he had the thought of the way to do that. Okay. The idea was probably uh, even more impressive than restriction enzymes were in terms of creating a revolution of biotechnology. Okay. That simple idea that he had, which I'll describe to you in a minute, absolutely transformed the way that we work with DNAs. Okay. He won the Nobel Prize uh, for his idea later. Okay. Really remarkable idea. And remarkably simple. Absolutely simple. Okay. How does it work? Well, let's imagine that I have a DNA fragment that I'm interested in isolating. Okay. I'd like to give this example to students. If I said, I took um, your genome, okay? I took the, the DNA from your genome, and I said if you took the DNA from one cell, it's about seven feet, right? Well, imagine I took the DNA, and I, that seven feet of DNA, and I stretched it all the way around this room to give you an idea about blowing something up in terms of size. So I got the DNA from one cell, and it's going all the way around this room. How big do you suppose an individual gene would be? Submillimeter. Very, very tiny. That tells you that a gene is a very, very tiny fraction of the coding of a person's DNA. Very, very tiny fraction of that DNA. The reason that we want to amplify DNA is we need to get that one little piece that we're interested in without amplifying all of the other stuff. Because if we amplify everything, then we still got to get that one little piece. And how do we get that one little piece? But if we can selectively make copies of only that one little piece and let everything else go by the wayside, now we have billions of copies of this little guy, which is easy to purify.
and one copy of this big guy that's not going to get in our way. You, you with me? So that's why PCR is important. People use PCR to analyze DNA at crime scenes because there are small sections of your DNA that can be identified as you. They use it to analyze ancient samples to see what kinds of DNA are in there. They use it to isolate genes. I like to tell the story, and this tells you how old I am, but when I was a graduate student uh, here at Oregon State back in the 1980s, before all of you were born, back in the 1980s, I see at least a couple people shaking their head no. But <laughs> anyway, so I was a graduate student here, and for my PhD thesis, one of the proposals that my mentor gave to me was I could isolate a human gene. And I turned it down because I said, there's no way on earth in the next three years that I could get it, this human gene that he wanted me to isolate, isolated. It was that technically difficult of a, of a, of a process to do at that time. With PCR, I could take any one of you in here today and show you how to amplify any gene in the human genome, and you would have it tomorrow. That's how revolutionary that technique was. Okay? All right, so quit jabbering. Let's tell you about the technique so we can move on. All right, so that tells you something about the power of that technique. Well, I've got a target sequence. I've got that little segment that I want, and I even know some of the sequence. We've sequenced the entire human genome. We know the sequence of all the genes. I want to lay my hands on a particular gene. So I know the sequence. How do I get it? Okay. Well, here's where I use a couple of tricks. One trick is, some, is the fact that DNA polymerase will only make DNA by extending a primer. Remember that, the primase? It will only extend an existing primer. It can't start a sequence on its own. So the first thing I do with this DNA that I've got in this room that's stretched all the way around there is I boil it. Imagine boiling this room. And I boil it so that one strand comes down to here and the other strand is up at the ceiling. The strands are separated of that one DNA that I'm interested in, OK? I know the sequences, and so in a laboratory, I have made an artificial primer. In fact, I've made two artificial primers. One that corresponds to a sequence at one end of the gene, and the other that corresponds to a sequence at the other end of the gene. Now, these are complementary to those sequences in those strands. So the primer is a short stretch. In this case, I make it of DNA, but I could make it of RNA. But I'm making it of DNA, a short stretch of DNA that's complementary. So I've separated my strands. I add my primers. And now I take this whole mixture that's in this room, and I cool it down. And when I cool it down, Something I like to say, and I don't say very often, but this is one place where it's appropriate, something magical actually happens. Because if I do it right, those sequences that are complementary to each other will find their complement and make a duplex. One primer will be right here, base paired to the strand that's down here. Now, you might want wonder if the strands will come back together. They don't. Don't worry about that. Okay? The big strands won't come back together. But the primer finds the sequence. And the reason that the primer finds the sequence instead of the strands finding each other is you've got several hundred million copies of the primer in there. You've only got one copy of each of the strands. right? So one here and the other one up over here on the complementary strand above. Everybody with me? What I've just done is what we see right here. I've separated the strands. I've got a primer on one end for one of the strands and a primer on the other end for the other strand. I've done what we call denaturing, that is boiling it to take the strands apart. I've done annealing, 
which is where I put the primers, finding their complementary sequence. And the last step is that I add a DNA polymerase that will now extend the primer. Extend, 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 extend. Okay. Now, you might think it, that thing will go on a long ways past there, and it can. Okay. That's fine. I'm not going to hurt anything. I don't do it for too long. But the important thing is I started with two strands of my sequence, and I now have four strands of my sequence. I've just doubled the number of strands that I have of my sequence. I boil it again. Now I have four strands that come apart. Right? I anneal. I elongate. And instead of having four strands, I now have eight strands. Every time I go through a cycle, and a cycle consists of boiling, annealing, replicating, boiling, annealing, replicating, boiling, annealing, replicating. Every time I do go through that cycle of boiling, annealing, and replicating, I double the number of strands that I've got, at least in theory. This is incredibly powerful. Well, it turns out that in the end, the only sequences I will end up with are not the run-ons, but actually only the ones between the primers are the ones I'll end up with. So that little tiny piece that I was after is the only thing I will end up with in the end. And I will have, after 30 rounds of replication, a theoretical increase of over 3 billion fold for that sequence. I start with one copy, I end up with, whoa, I end up with 3 billion. There we go, I don't know why that went off. What's shutting down? <laughs> They're speaking to me up here, do you know that? It says, Ahern, you're talking too long. Okay, I will finish this, okay, I will finish this. And I have a clever way to give you extra credit, too. So, OK. All right. Everybody understand what I just said? Everybody can tell me how to do PCR? One of the really cool things that Kerry Mullis invented in this process was he used a DNA polymerase that was different than the DNA polymerase that's found in your cells. He used something called a thermostable DNA polymerase. Thermostable means that can be boiled without losing its activity. He actually isolated the polymerase from a bacterium that's found in a hot spring in Yellowstone Park. It actually came from the Old Faithful Geyser. The Old Faithful Geyser had these bacteria that grow in these boiling conditions, and their proteins are stable to boiling. Well, what that meant was every time he went through a boiling cycle, he didn't have to add more enzyme because the enzyme stayed active. And typically, in 30, 30 cycles, it takes about 90 minutes to do 30 cycles, depending on how you set it up. In 90 minutes, he could have a billion copies of something he started with one copy of. Remarkably powerful. OK. I said I would finish early, so I'm finishing. Well, actually, I was going to sing a song. But you guys don't want a song. You want to get out and enjoy the weather, right? We'll start with a song next time, all right? Um,